I'd like to welcome up Patrick. Because a cultural change in uh, technology, it's a journey we've all been on for a while, with DevOps, SRE, it's still something that people still grapple with and we can. it's a journey that we can all get better at. So, Patrick, over to you, please. Oh, yeah. I didn't actually introduce That's myself fine. properly. <laughs> I, I lead the uh, customer-facing technical teams for Amir and APJ. Um, also, the self-serve product-led growth uh, technical uh, engine and that's because as a business, our, our, our strategy is to bring in product-led growth, so our self-serve funnel, and then graduate accounts up to being sales-led. Um, and that's how we you know, focus a lot on customer success as a consumption-based business. So that's me. So, uh, yeah, missed that. Okay, well, well, thank you, Duncan, for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, so my name is Patrick Highland. I'm the Senior Engineering Manager at Domino's. I've been in this role for about uh, two years. And what I'd like to speak to you about today is uh, the journey that we went on in terms of uh, doing a modernization of uh, Domino's uh, platform into sort of a next-gen uh, platform. So I'll be talking to that. Uh, go to that slide. So, so Duncan, um, as I say, thank you for inviting me. It's probably, not, yeah, it's probably, not the first time we've met. It's right? not the first time, probably about um, six or seven years ago that we met last at a conference in Johannesburg in South Africa. Yeah. And uh, it's quite a long time. It's good to see you again. And you, and you. Uh, it was a great conference that, in fact, Johannesburg has got a lot of space to move around. Uh, it's a bit, bit different from London. Uh, and uh, yes, we enjoyed a, a good meal at a Northern Suburbs restaurant yeah. uh, afterwards with yourself and your colleagues and other people from the conference. We should have eaten pizza. <laughs> we, we should have eaten pizza, have but eaten that was pizza. before your Domino's days. That's right. I, th I think I had a tasty steak on that occasion. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about Phoenix. Uh, so Phoenix is the name that we've given to the transformation of uh, our legacy platform. And uh, Phoenix, uh, it comes from Greek mythology, as I'm sure many of you will know. It represents the... Uh, the recreation of a bird from its ashes into something new. And uh, that, that, that metaphor is really talking about, in the Domino's context, uh, moving from a legacy-based platform into a more modernized microservice platform. Uh, Domino's itself is a franchisee business. Uh, it has circa 1,200 stores across both the UK and Ireland. It's probably a bit more than that, in fact, now. And um, the customers get to enjoy the purchase of pizza from those restaurants using a couple of different channels. So they get to purchase on the mobile app that you mentioned, mm -hmm. also the web channel, and more recently a Just Eat channel, which we've integrated as well. Uh, the franchisees themselves have certain capabilities uh, through an application which we call Dom Central, uh, which gives them the ability to, for example, uh, modify menus, uh, uh, assign prices with menus, uh, uh, configure meal deals, uh, bundle together uh, those meal deals with vouchers, for example, to run national campaigns. And uh, they can also modify uh, store data to uh, switch their stores on and off. Um, some of the other types of things that they can do through the platform is to reduce the catchment area uh, for a particular address if they're under pressure, for example, and they can't uh, deliver pizza at a particular time. So lots of integrations from this DOM central application into our back end. It's interesting. I didn't know that they had that sort of level of control that where they could change the menu and... Uh, yes, absolutely. It's very much sort of a delegation of that down to them. So it gives them as much autonomy as possible yeah. Yeah. Uh, to do that. And as I say, there's a lot of franchisee restaurants uh, uh, that, that would be uh, doing that uh, at different times of the year. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to go through the architecture of um, the Domino's application, uh, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And uh, that will sort of take me to a place where I can talk to you about the SRE capability that we've built. Right, so firstly, I'm going to show you how people purchased pizza from Domino's probably about four or five years ago now. So a very standard uh, three-tier model. We've got uh, a monolith application. It's uh, 
a .NET monolith fronted by IIS with a SQL server backing it. And uh, what the customers would do is just uh, bring up a web browser, integrate into that monolith, and they would purchase, purchase pizza that way. So very simple, very straightforward. Uh, what we wanted to do then was to decouple that front end from the monolith. So this was the first pattern that we took in order to modernize uh, the, the platform. And in order to do that, uh, what we did is introduce this API facade layer in front of the monolith. And the API facade layer essentially will expose certain utilities within the monolith, uh, present those as APIs, giving us the ability to put a front-end, back-end for front-end architecture, BFF, into the architecture as well. So what this is, is a Node.js application. It has the ability to connect through to this API facade layer, and it will also connect a client on the left-hand side. And so what you end up with is a Vue.js application. We started using that technology because it gives us quite a lot of reactivity in the front-end which we otherwise didn't have. Uh, so this decoupling really modernized the front end and put us in a position whereby the Vue.js application can talk to the Node.js BFF and it can now interact with the APIs on the API facade layer. And this was probably done about two years ago uh, and was our starting point for Phoenix, which is what follows mm -hmm. in terms of this architecture. So with Phoenix, what we wanted to do was to peel off the utilities from the API facade layer into a set of microservices. And uh, what we did to get that started was to put in place a Kubernetes cluster and have that fronted by an API gateway. So the product that we chose was uh, Solos, uh, Glue Edge, and Glue Mesh. Uh, their product is pretty developer friendly. Uh, it's essentially a way to configure an Envoy proxy and an Istio proxy, uh, but it allows, it allows you to pass in configurations uh, as custom, custom re uh, resource definitions uh, into Kubernetes uh, that are easier to configure than just raw Envoy configurations. That gives us the ability now to connect from the BFF a path into the API facade layer, but also a path into uh, the API gateway. And this is really the starting point for starting to be able to build the backend microservices and switch the traffic into this Kubernetes cluster. So in addition to that, uh, what we needed was the ability to send traffic when it comes into the cluster back out. And uh, Glue has this uh, capability, or this piece of technology rather, called a Glue external service connector, which allows us to have a route back to the API facade layer. I'll show you in a moment um, the reason for this. It, it's in order to be able to split traffic uh, across those two platforms in sort of a dual running phase. So the program of developers that are developing uh, Phoenix, and, and there's quite a large group of teams, it's about 10 teams in total, they're using a domain-driven development approach. And essentially what they would be doing is building these backend microservices. So these are Docker containers. Uh, they have a .NET runtime within them. And they essentially host endpoints uh, that are accessible by the front end. Uh, I'll use an example uh, just to, uh, to show you what this is about. So we've got an endpoint called store list. If you go onto our website, you're able to put in a postcode and you're able to see the stores, the Domino's franchisee restaurants within a geographical radius around your postcode. So that would be a store list endpoint sitting within store. So we'll stick with that just to show you the rest of this architecture and the way that we switch traffic across uh, the new Phoenix platform and the legacy system. To start off with, what, what our team would do is to put store list into a mirror mode. So we have customers putting in postcodes through the front end, uh, coming through Akamai into uh, the Kubernetes platform, or the Kubernetes cluster rather, hitting store list, but just in mirror, so that uh, the actual response is dropped. And we have the ability to observe uh, that endpoint to make sure that it's operating as intended. But the real traffic moves through the external connector to 
the API facade, and that's what serves the real traffic. So this is a, a way to observe the, the new endpoint to make sure it's working as it should before bringing it live. To bring it live, we start to use a canary pattern. So with canary, it would be a configuration within the API gateway, which tells that traffic that I've just uh, spoken about to place 10% of the real traffic onto this endpoint to serve that to the customer, but to have 90% of the traffic moving through the API, go, going to the API facade. So th this is a gradual testing out and proving out of, um, of that endpoint uh, for Phoenix. And then of course, what we do is we just go to a, a second ratio on that, 50-50, and then to 100 and zero. That approach cuts the traffic across onto Phoenix. And in the main, that's repeated through all of the other domain-driven uh, microservices. So we've got a couple of other ones there, menu customer, order, order and baskets, and deals. Uh, they, there is some complexity, of course, in terms of the engineering around interactions within this cluster. But this is the <coughs> overarching architecture for moving traffic from the monolith into Phoenix. And this is predominantly what our SREs are concerned with. Uh, in addition to making these uh, endpoints within the, these domain services highly reliable as well. Question, Patrick. So when you, for the Canary deployment, and you, you know, it's 90 to 10%, 90, and then you break it down over a period of time, how to get to that, formalize that, that way of working, was that a lot of trial and error or they just best practice sort of numbers? It's, it's best practice. We, we, it's best practice in terms of, of us deciding what that ratio should be initially as a, a group of senior uh, yep. engineers within the organization and just providing that sort of in a initially prescriptive way to, to the teams that were going to be transitioning their service into, uh, services into production. But uh, later on, we've given quite a lot of autonomy to the teams mm -hmm. to decide on what sort of ratio uh, they, they, they might start with. So they might even start with a 2% ratio, for example, okay. or they might go straight up to a 50% if, they, if they're confident about that. And then there's, what, what does the review look like? Is that like a stand up where we'd say, okay, we've measured the 10%, it's looking good, we can... Yeah, so I'll get, I'll get onto some of that stuff when I show you the, S, the actual SR, SRE capability, but mm -hmm. it is very much the observation of error budgets, uh, alerts within your relic, uh, service level indicators yeah. across, for example, golden signals to make sure that the, uh, the endpoint is performing as it should, uh, ideally in the mirror stage, you know, before you actually start to ramp it up, yeah. but then also through the canary as well. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so the other thing that we have are a couple of SaaS external providers that we integrate into. And we have a data sync running across from the legacy platform to the uh, a database within one of these SaaS providers. This, this gives us sort of atomic uh, data state on both sides, which is necessary in order to run uh, in a dual fashion across these two uh, platforms. Okay, so that's the high level arch architecture, Duncan. Uh, which uh, it's important to understand because the SRE capability will be talking to this. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, it's been really interesting actually to see your journey from the monolith. And it's laid it out in a very understandable way. So That's Thank great. You. I mean, we haven't done anything particularly special here, except we're trying to do it right. Yep. But this is very much an acknowledged approach, approach to, um, I think the, the pattern is called a strangle pattern where you, you start bleeding off the microservices from this facade. Okay, so this is really where the talk really starts. I mean, this was just background initially that I gave, uh, just to aid understanding. Uh, w when we started the Phoenix program, we had a very traditional on-call uh, type um, support function at Domino's, uh, focused around that decoupling of the front end, but also sort of the traditional monolith technology. And the engineers, for the most part, were often called out to respond to incidents um, on technology uh, components within the estate, which they hadn't really had any exposure to. Right? So what I wanted to do was to really uh, re-innovate, uh, recreate uh, the support capability, but to extend it to make it a reliability engineering capability. So 
the question was, how do we create this capability for uh, Domino's, uh, associating that with the Phoenix program? And enjoying uh, academic journals, I read, uh, I, I read the work of some academics just to explore uh, generic capability and what's important in terms of generic capability. Mm -hmm. So one of these uh, academics is uh, Dorothy Leonard, and in her uh, journal called The Wellsprings of Knowledge, she talks about a capability, any capability, having four dimensions to it. So you'd have um, technical systems within that capability, you'd have uh, skills, you'd have managerial systems, and you'd have a set of values that is, that, that is operating across this capability. As a generic, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking specifically about SRE now, I'm just talking in Yeah, I could see how sense. that could be applied to many things. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of yeah. sense. So the other academic that I looked at was this chap called Thies, and he talks about dynamic capabilities. You know, so the, the capability uh, in, in, in the initial sense is very static. What he talks about is the renewal of those dimensions, the innovation of those dimensions, and specifically uh, the firm's ability to integrate, build, and, and reconfigure the internal and external competencies that are running in that capability. So. As things change, I mean, just, just to give you an example on this, uh, if we have a look 10 years ago at the way that we might do support on that three-tier architecture that mm -hmm. I showed you, it's very different technology in there. It's very different skills yep. compared to what's necessary now. So you, you might have a support, you could even call it a reliability engineering capability 10 years ago, but the profile across those dimensions are very different to what they would be now. I totally agree. Yeah. Very, very different, yeah. Very yeah. different. So looking at, look, looking at, you know, drawing on that material, what we decided to do was to use an anatomy of capability approach uh, to SRE. And uh, I sometimes call this the capability pizza, <laughs> 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 because that's how I've re represented it <laughs> at the bottom left, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got those dimensions. I've, I've created icons uh, across those, because I'd like to show you those icons on a systems map a bit later on where we really embody the, uh, the capability, bring it to life. Uh, but you've got the technical systems, as I've said. In our case, those would be things like the front end and the back end systems that I talked you through in the architecture, a alongside a whole bunch of other things as well. I mean, for example, we're using a GitOps model. Mm -hmm. We use Argo CD to roll uh, configurations on Kubernetes down a pipeline. Those are all technical systems. Yeah. And then skills. The SRE engineers will have certain skills across those technology systems that they'll need to be reasonably competent at for the capability to actually operate. Uh, there's management systems uh, that, uh, that are present uh, in, in the capability. And there's also values. Uh, values we'll get into in, in a moment. Uh, but just as, as an example, if you had a, a capability that uh, specialized, that moved freight from the US to Australia, there need to be a certain value system in the, in the people that work in that capability. There need to be a sense of urgency. They need to care about logistics, for example. Now, SRE is different, but it depends on what one's doing. There has to be a value set in there. And then routine activities. Uh, so a capability, fundamentally, when it's created and it sort of settles, it, it, it starts operating routine activities, almost as standard operating procedures. The standard operating procedures can be quite complex. So I'm not talking about a simple sort of one, two, three, four year, uh, a checkbox exercise that perhaps a first line support engineer is doing. They can be quite complex tasks, but they do settle and crystallize into uh, standard operating pr procedures that are repeatable. A and then of course there's the learning aspect, the ability to reconfigure that capability over time. Okay, so. What I don't like about this is it's very two-dimensional, right, when I talk about capability in this sense. It doesn't really bring it to life in terms of how things flow uh, systematically. So to, to emphasize that uh, and to, to allow myself and my SRE manager to reflect on that, what we've also used is a reconfigurable systems model to uh, show the capability in action. And I'll, I'll get onto that in a moment and show you how that works.
Okay, so sticking with the two-dimensional view just for the time being and, and sort of moving away from that um, abstract, almost academic discussion around that capability and more into a, uh, a more concrete SRE capability for dominoes. Uh, this, this is what we're looking at. And there's a lot of material here, so I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to highlight the, the bold bits. So on the technical systems, we need to be familiar with the view uh, technology, the node technology in our BFF. We need to be fully familiar with .NET, the API gateway. So all of those service domains, uh, also the domain-driven development um, microservices that are running within the Kubernetes cluster. The API gateway specifically, I was showing how we can mm -hmm. cut and mirror and canary. Um, that technical system needs to be very well understood within the capability. Absolutely. And then on New Relic, I mean, there's a, a, a variety of different uh, observability um, uh, uh, instrumentation approaches that we take on New Relic. We are instrumenting the, uh, the applications across that architecture stack using APMs to pass in uh, mm -hmm. metrics. Uh, we've had to consider things such as uh, uh, how we forward logs uh, for log analysis. I mean, you can use something such as the APM itself, or you can use Fluently to, to forward that across. Those are all things that uh, the teams need to consider, including, for example, distributed tracing, yep. uh, which, is, which is something the guys need to know as well. I think for, your, um, for the architecture that you, you have there, I would imagine distributed tracing is like pretty key, fundamental of understanding that ecosystem. Absolutely, yeah, because it's such a distributed ecosystem. Yeah. So that tracing gives us a visualization of um, how each one of those components are working um, across the various spans uh, that uh, an HTTP request would take through mm -hmm. the entire infrastructure. Okay, good to hear. Okay, so the skills and the capability, th these skills are very much connected to the routine activities. These routine activities encapsulate the skills and what we expect our engineers to have is a knowledge of reliability architectures. Now, when I think about this, I, I go straight to Michael Nygaard's Release It book, where he talks about um, patterns for reliability and anti-patterns that work against reliability. And these might be things such as, uh, might be as simple as just putting in a timeout. Uh, it might be more co complex where you have a... Uh, a database with a cache, a cache in front of it, and that cache is uh, is bust sometimes, and you might have a stampede on that database during a very busy period where we're selling a lot of pizza. Uh, so how do you balance that out? How do you throttle that? They are architectures which which can address those problems, and the engineers need to be familiar with those. Uh, we also need to know about SLOs and error budgets uh, because SRE is very much a data driven exercise that has made certain commitments through SLOs to the business mm -hmm. that need to be need to be watched. Problem analysis, I mean, we, we spoke about distributing tr distributed tracing. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll try and just give, give you an example of, um, of what that looks like. There you go. Okay, so this is a good example of what our engineers need to be familiar with in terms of distributed tracing. I won't go through all of this, obviously, but this, this shows um, on the left-hand side the entry point into that, uh, that BFF that I was showing you. And then it moves through to the store microservice that I showed you. It, it then will talk out through the external connector to another API in that facade. And this is all sort of mapped out in what, what are called spans, uh, which gives us the ability to have a look at uh, the millisecond speed across these uh, mm -hmm. different links. And uh, also, if we expanded all of these, you'll see sort of the internal spans as well. So this is a skill which uh, the SRE engineers need to have to work with on that capability. That's good. Thank you. And then this dimension of management. I mean, I work with a great SRE manager based out in India, and he's very passionate about SRE. He's uh, stood up uh, an SRE function in, in another organization, large organization, and is very much an innovator. So he'll work with me to have a look at the systems model, which I'll show you in a short while, to reflect on that and to uh, decide which technologies we should be bringing in, how we should be changing our practices. But he's also a very practical person because it's not just about thinking about innovation. Sometimes you have to deal with that brass tax operational incident management type uh, 
uh, issue. And uh, he's able to take control of a sort of a major incident that might have bypassed the SRE controls and run that. And the point I'm making is you need somebody like that within the capability. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just talking about what he's doing. If you're building a capability like this, you need somebody like that besides the engineers uh, themselves uh, to, to manage uh, SRE as a system. The values, uh, this is not out of a textbook. These are the values that we have decided that are good for our SRE engineers. And uh, number one, they need to be aware, Duncan. So they need to know what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. and I don't think SRE is the type of discipline where somebody can get deep into a problem and just stay there for a long period of time. Uh, they need to know, for example, that uh, a, a team that has deployed an endpoint that their application relies on has done that, and they might want to check the uh, error budgets and golden signals with the application after they do that. So definitely an awareness. They also need to be quite bold. You know, it's not a shrinking violet. Everybody's got their own personality, but I don't think it's a shrinking violet sort of um, role because they need to make a case to stop the line and not have things go, go out into production. Um, or they need to assertively say that we need to use a specific type of uh, architectural pattern to uh, increase the reliability. Uh, so they can't take a back seat because yep. the consequence of that is we would stop selling pizza you know, during a major incident. Yep. Uh, it's a very technical role. So <clears throat> yeah, it is a developer role. Uh, they need to have a good understanding of uh, API gateway configurations, uh, DevOps, GitOps, the very technical role. They also need to be collaborative. I often find that the main people they're collaborating with is the performance uh, testing team. You know, the, okay. the performance testing team has got a very much a connected um, mission with SRE. It's not always seen that way, but it's, it's certainly the way I see it. And, but they don't, they don't always talk the same language. You know, so there's a, there's a certain connecting up, and the manager can help with that, but uh, collaboration uh, with the groups around them, very important. Empathetic. Uh, they have to be empathetic because with the best will in the world, sometimes things do, do go wrong. And uh, in order to do, for example, a, post, a, post, a blameless post-mortem, uh, you can't be too hard yeah. on yourself, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can't be too hard on the other person. But you still have to take accountability, but it, it has to be done in the right way. And then data-driven. Uh, as I say, SRE is a very data-driven endeavor. You've got the SLOs, you've got the SLIs, you've got the error budgets, and that's really uh, uh, indicating to uh, the individuals what they should be doing with yeah. those teams. I think, and because we touched on sort of culture, and you know, anyone can read the uh, SRE book. Um, so I like the way that you've come at it with the anatomy model of a capability. Um, these, so when you're hiring people, are, you, are they already there or do you take it, it, it them is, there? Well, it is to an extent implied because yeah. somebody that's going to be working within this discipline will sort of have that profile. Yeah. Uh, but we would test some of those uh, things at interview as well uh, just to make sure. Sure. The service goes down, whose fault is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> See what that, that's where the empathy comes in, in right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think that's really important. And um, yeah, and then it sounds like yeah. you're building a good practice. That, that's probably the, the heart of the capability, yeah. I would say. Without that, the, the, the other pieces exactly. won't actually materialize. Yep. And then sort of just moving through the other two quite quickly, um, the routine activities, the primary activity that the SRE engineers are involved in is reliability engineering. And um, I'll show you in the systems uh, view what that actually means for us. Uh, but they're also involved in setting up the monitors, the observability with, with the new Relic system, and then support preparation and early life support as well. And then the learning aspect. The learning aspect is really for the SRE manager and anybody else that's involved, like myself, to reflect on the dimensions to see what might change yeah. as, as time passes. Excellent. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you the embodiment of this SRE capability for Domino's in a systems view. Um, in the first instance, we have somebody up there that's reflecting across this entire view, which I will now show you. This is a model. It represents the way that uh, we think SRE should work in the organization. 
obviously the model doesn't always match reality, so we need to we need we need to watch that. But um, uh, it it's the way that it's intended to work. So in the first instance, we have this is showing the structure of the teams. We have eight uh, Phoenix teams, and the composition of those teams are a number of developers plus uh, software engineers and test and an SRE. Duncan, how am I doing for time? Oh, uh, you're good. I'm okay. good. Okay, we're, good. We're good. Uh, the, the developers, the software engineers and test, and the SRE is actually embedded within the team. And that's really repeated through all of these teams. I've, cred I've, I've used some notation here to show, you know, the SRE engineers will have those values that I just spoke about. They will have a certain skill profile that we spoke about in the two, in the two dimensional view. And um, the teams have a scrum master that's working to work with the developers to actually build the product, uh, those microservices that I was showing you. So the SRE is actually embedded within the team and participating within that team. But at the same time, that SRE engineer is present in a separate stand-up with, um, uh, with the SRE manager. So all eight of these SREs will go into that separate stand-up with the manager. And the manager is really observing what's going on across that entire group, sort of at scale, uh, to make sure that they are doing certain uh, routine activities, which I'll get onto now, uh, to monitor that. Because that's really what the manager should be doing. They should be observing the system and monitoring that those individuals are doing the right things uh, across the program. Just before I show, the, show you those activities, the, the developers are using a, a, a set of environments. We use ADO uh, to move the product left to right into production. And we use a GitOps workflow. I mentioned a technology mm -hmm. called Argo uh, to, uh, to, to move that into Kubernetes as we, as we go along. The SRE manager, as I was saying a moment ago, they are monitoring and controlling certain activities which will now be happening. So the primary set of activities are these reliability engineering activities. And the SRE engineers in the first instance are expected to have a look at a low-level design document that's come from the architects for the endpoint that is under development in the team. And they look at that. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example of what that looks like. Right, I use, I use the store list endpoint, uh, so you guys are somewhat familiar with that now. Uh, this is the design document. If I move down, you'll see there's a component design. I won't go through that detail, but the SRE engineers are looking at that uh, to understand what the design of the endpoint that their team is working on is all about. Uh, what they'll do then is they'll consider those reliability patterns that I spoke about and think about how they can make that uh, as reliable as possible. They also do something called a component failure impact, mm -hmm. impact analysis to determine the consequence of any failures of those components. And after doing that analysis, they will capture stories uh, onto the backlog sure. that's being done within this development team and, and then be responsible for fulfilling those stories. Okay, yeah. Okay, at some point, uh, the engineers will start working on uh, monitoring setup, setup activities. So yeah, what we're talking about, and we've standardized this, is to configure golden signals. There are four typical golden signals that we'd want to monitor on our endpoints. Uh, so those are latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. And uh, I think I'll just show you this quickly. Right, so this is an example of the store list endpoint. Uh, you've got the traffic on the left-hand side, you've got the error rate, you've got the response time, and you've got CPU usage across the pods and also memory utilization for the, satura for the satura saturation element of the golden signals. There are some other things to be monitored in here as well, but this is sort of a standardized view that the SRE engineer is expected to build for every single endpoint, uh, and, and that's a capability activity. What they'll do then is they'll, config, they'll, they'll configure service level objectives and create error budgets because we've made certain commitments on these yep. APIs. And I'll show you that. So this is just for the store domain. Uh, so you can see 
You've got availability on store details, uh, latency, and then store list, which is the one I've been referring to, is the same. You've got the SLO, so we're talking about 99.6% uh, availability uh, for store list, and uh, latency is 95% of requests should respond in less than 600 milliseconds. That's not shown there, but that's what it means. And, and then you've got the compliance across time intervals and also the error budgets. Uh, across the time frames. That's right. Uh, th this really steers us in terms of management activities, uh, indicating what should be done. And these are all teams. perimeter points that touch, that the customer touches, right? These ones? Yes, here? they are. They are. These, these are these are touched by the front, that BFF component, yep. which will uh, take traffic from the web browser, for example, and then talk to these endpoints. And did you, and was it as simple as, okay, these are the endpoints, these are the services that we've built, the domain services, that's what we're going to create an SLO against, and then obviously the indicators underneath. Is that? It is pretty much as simple as that. We initially had to design what we would measure in terms of those SLOs. Yeah, because you don't want too many. Right. That's, that's right. You, you can start to go a bit mad and yep. put in a whole bunch, but then you really dilute. There's such a wide variety of data, it's difficult to, you get cognitive load, you get cognitive overload, you know, to yep. try and understand all of that stuff. So I think the, the key for me is to just stick with the golden signals initially, yep. um, and, and that's a good starting point. We, we have extended this with uh, synthetics as well. Yep. Um, so we we're able to run a couple of customer journeys across the site. Yeah, we rec we actually recommend that in our documentation as a best practice around SLO as a SLO. Uh, yeah, abso everybody. absolutely. I mean, we've recently um, uh, brought live a modernized login process, and login is a perfect example of a customer journey. Uh, th there, we'd be having a look at the availability of the of the synthetic. Yep. Um, and also the duration that it takes for the synthetic to run all the way through. Very good. Right, so all of that gets set up. The SREs will also create these uh, service desk uh, support playbooks. So w when, there, when there is an alert that goes out, it does go to our service desk initially. Mm -hmm. And the service desk wants quite prescriptive um, uh, documentation. Well, I wouldn't documentation, it's probably overstating it. They just want to be told what to do. You know, as con yeah. con contact contact this team, contact that team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we we might extend those sometimes if there are some complex routines that the SRE engineer needs to run for a, spe a specific incident condition. Those playbooks would contain that as well. Right. And then the SRE engineer will configure these baseline deviation alerts uh, for the endpoint, off of the golden signals. Okay, so there's also support preparation activities. Uh, this is now getting closer to where we actually do a release. And uh, it's important for me that the, uh, the lead developer will walk through the code with the SRE engineer. It doesn't have to walk through it in great fine detail, but I, I'd like the SRE engineer to have sort of a semblance of what the different parts of that code is doing. So we, 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 ha we run that activity there where, where he does that. And of course, there's also ongoing contextual updates to that stand up with the peers as to what's going on. And the, the primary reason for that, Duncan, is that um, the after hour support uh, rotor doesn't have a one to one mapping with the SRE engineers supporting right. the teams. I mean, I know there's other ways of doing that. You can put your developers on call, uh, but we, we don't do that. So the, the diffusion of that knowledge to the extent possible happens you know, across the entire SRE group happens in this meeting so that the SRE engineers can support. It maps to the aware yeah. Yeah. Exactly. value, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And stops the creation of a silo. And, yeah. Exactly. Uh, at times when there's a major feature that goes into production, we also ask the SRE engineer to do a, a KT to the service desk lead. That's based on judgment, though. It doesn't happen for every single transition. Okay, so we get to a point we've, where we've got all of these uh, golden signals that I showed you and the error budgets set up for a particular endpoint. In the case of an API, we're looking at availability, latency, mm -hmm. error rate. Um, for the synthetics, we've got availability and duration. The engineers would have configured the alerts, which are now going down to the service desk, plus the entire eight SRE group. 
and, uh, and at, at this point we're ready to go into production. So the approach we use in this capability, so the technology approach, this is now talking to the API gateway, is we use a de-risked production uh, release approach. And that means in the first instance we'll take that endpoint, call it store list, we'll, we'll take it into the cluster dormant, so mm -hmm. it'll just be deployed there. And the, the, the second action we take is to run a mirror. Um, as I was showing in the architecture diagram, that just gives us an observation while the legacy platform uh, serves the traffic. And then we start the canary, 10%, 20%. What the engineers are doing while it's going into mirror and canary is they're watching these things and they're watching that. And that really gives them a, uh, the ability to roll things back if things are going wrong mm -hmm. in the support activity over here. Uh, and they get to a point where things are okay, and then they start ramping that up. Yeah, that, I like this because the architecture that you laid up earlier and with the gateway and the canary and uh, mirror, this is actually the, the dim more the multi-dimensional model of what people are actually doing at that time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah this really brings it to life. It sort yeah. of embodies it. The other one is sort of a two-dimensional view. I, I agree. Okay, so um, finally, what I'd like to show you, uh, well, not quite finally, there's one more thing, but uh, what we've done is we've modernized the change management process. And uh, if, if you're familiar with the traditional change management process, when you raise a change, you have to go to a cab for a normal change. It tends to happen quite infrequently. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, it happens twice a week, but sometimes it happens once a week. And it really slows things down. So it was slowing us I'm down. I'm looking forward to how, how you solved it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> These two quite clash. That's right. High tool and agile. That's right. Yeah, well, those are always two, uh, two different domains that can uh, inspire quite passionate uh, conversations because people are sometimes sitting mm -hmm. on opposite sides of the fence, right? Although over, over the last couple of years, there has been a big attempt to sort of bring a lot of that thinking yep. together. But it, it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, so what, what we did is we said we would use something called standard change, which is a pre-approved change in the ITIL world. And the, the teams are allowed to just put things into production after raising a standard change in the change management system, as long as the error budget is okay. Yeah, that's, the, that's the key control element. If the error budget is okay and they're using this one, two, three, four, they can just go for it. They can do as much standard change as they want. You know? uh, but if the error budget is breached, then the sting in the tail is getting the team to go to the normal change management process. Uh, and th this really just gets them to take the reliability even more seriously than they yeah, otherwise course, would. Yeah. And of course, it's not a life sentence. You don't have to go to normal ch change, the change management meeting for the rest of your life. You only go there until the error budget is okay again. And, and, then, then, and then you're back into this standard change. And, and then new relic, what was that question? Oh, right. It's a naughty corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and New Relic is part of that, is the key part of that error budget, okay or breached? That's Ab Absolutely, absolutely. So I, we probably don't have time to go back to it, but if you remember the, the view that I, I yep. showed with the, it's got a, um, a two hour interval, a one day interval, a 28 day interval. Yep. Uh, that's showing you the uh, compliance with the error budget over those intervals. We, we attach a 20 day, 28 day interval to this. Okay. It is possible to breach a 28 day interval quite quickly, though, if things have really gone wrong. Uh, but there's some flexibility, of course, because the, the engineers need to have uh, the ability to eat into some of that error budget because it allows them to innovate and sort of yep. uh, take, uh, that uh, take creative approaches, particularly if they want to start modifying some of the mechanics in here and maybe uh, ramp up a bit quicker. Um, uh, or, or do something else in this process. But we leave that for the more mature teams once they understand the general process and, and they, can, they can then uh, take those uh, decisions then. We'll be watching these error budgets then. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's actually quite simple the way that you've approached it. Um, but uh, it seems very, um, they say data driven, like it's going to be very um, accurate and because you are under pressure to keep innovating, right? We are, um, yeah, yeah. But and it's it, got to be reliable. It, it is very data-driven in terms of, it gives us an indication as to whether the, these teams over here yeah, should be focusing on the building of features or whether they should be taking 
those early activities, the reliability engineering activities more seriously. Uh, so if the aero budget is just blasting out, they should be stopping the feature development entirely. Yep. And they should be focusing on reliability. If the aero budget is really healthy, they could dampen down on the reliability because they're clearly, they're clearly doing it right. Yep. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay, so then, then just finally, there has to be something that closes the loop. And, and I talk about the SRE manager managing the system. This is the SRE system that I've described. And uh, the closing of the loop is that SRE manager going into this weekly engineering meeting, which is a governance meeting, which we run. Uh, and they will talk through the live endpoints with the SLIs, the SLOs, and we'll get an early view, Duncan, as to if any of these teams are trending in the wrong direction. Okay. And okay. we can just orchestrate some management actions at that stage. Yeah. Excellent. Put them on the right path. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Thank so you. That's pretty much it.